I have changed the title because on reflection I thought I could be a bit more expansive about Isabel's career, which is actually very pertinent to the topic of the exhibition. Um, and so rather than just address the jewellery that Isabella owned, I wanted to think a little bit more about how jewellery figured in her life at certain points. And none of the jewels that Isabella owned is known to survive. And yet, I would argue from the moment of her betrothal to England's Prince Edward in 1303, jewellery began to punctuate her narrative in a very meaningful and lasting way. So the revised title also expresses something about Isabella's infamous history. Queen, traitor, diplomat. Um, is she really does have a phenomenal career. I mean, it's astonishing what this woman achieves. She was probably born in about 1295. Um, chronicle accounts, of course, some confusion on this. Um, Piers of Langs uh, Langstoff refers to her as being seven years of age in 1299 which corresponds to the Annals of Wigmore account that also places her year of birth at 1292. However, she's described by the French chronicler Guillaume de Nongy and the English source Thomas of Walsingham as being 12 years old when she was married um, in 1308, which would place her date of birth somewhere between January 1295 and January 1296. Given that in 1298, Pope Boniface VIII had determined that she should marry Edward, then Prince of Wales, when she, was, when she reached the age of 12, and that the Treaty of Montreuil, drawn up in June 1299, stipulated that she should be married between the canonical ages of 7 and 12, it would seem that she was age 7 before the time of her betrothal in 1303 and 12 before January 1308 when she was married. So although um, none of her jewellery is known to survive... One item uh, that has been linked to her trousseau from her father, Philippe Lebel, uh, is this diminutive silver gilt casket that stands only seven centimetres tall but punches above its weight at the British Museum. Um, the French king, Philippe IV, also known as... Uh, uh, sorry, um, its sloping roof is decorated with, um, on one side, as seen here, the arms of Isabella expressing a union with Edward, and on the other side, the arms of Margaret, the half-sister of Philippe Lebel, who married Edward's father, Edward I, in 1299. So together, these two royal matches were a confirmation of the peace between France and England after the three bloody years of conflict that raged between 1294 and 1297. So it's long been suggested that rather than forming part of Isabella's trousseau, uh, the casket was probably a gift from Margaret to Isabella because of the heraldic devices that are displayed on the roof of the casket between the year of her betrothal to Edward in 1303 and the year of her marriage in 1308. The connection made between this object and Isabella's trousseau um, stems from a reference in the account of her wedding gifts from her father to a silver gilt chrismatory. So while traces of a tripartite division inside the casket may reinforce the notion that this may once have served at some point as a chrismatory, it may equally have been divided to contain small items of jewellery, such as rings and brooches, of a size suitable for a young girl of 12. So this is my preferred interpretation for obvious reasons, because it sort of suits the purpose of my talk. But uh, it's, uh, um, And I think also when we look at chrismatory um, forms, they usually carry some indication of their sacramental contents, either through their distinctive trilobal form that persists throughout the me medieval period, as seen in an example on the left, uh, also from the BM, <laughs> or through the use of sacred imagery as seen in the 13th century example on the right from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Another means of denoting their functions of chrismatory is the use of appropriate biblical inscriptions or the engraving of initials on each of the three separate compartments to assist the priest in administering the correct potion for the ceremony in question. The letter C, according, was used to represent chrisma for its use in confirmation and ordination. I was used for oleum infamorum, the oil for um, healing the sick, and B for oleum catechumenorum, which was used in baptism. So these features are missing from the British Museum casket. And while I think we can concede that the shrine-like form might be sufficient um, to indicate a religious use, the dominant position of the heraldry, which, um, remember, would originally have been brightly coloured with enamels, give a much stronger secular flavour to this uh, powerful little object. As I've already intimated, 
The wedding of Isabella to Edward took place in 1308. It was conducted in Boulogne, immediately recognisable from the slide. <laughs> um, uh, this depiction of the event in Jean de Vavrin's Ancienne et Nouvelle Chronique d'Angleterre, painted uh, quite some time after the event, between about 1471 and 1483. And incidentally, this manuscript from the British Library would fit perfectly in the exhibition upstairs, um, as it was made um, in Bruges for um, an English patron, um, none other than Edward IV, who was portrayed um, in the opening pages of the manuscript, um, being presented with the book uh, by Jean de Vavrin. So apart from the artist's rather fanciful notion of the topography of Boulogne, this illustration also de departs from reality in the depiction of the young Isabella, who we've already established was a girl of only 12 at the time of her marriage. Um, so this marginal illustration by Matthew Paris from the um, uh, Chronique Ang Angloron um, shows um, Henry III and Eleanor of Provence um, and appears possibly to express more successfully the relative ages between a king and his queen at the time of their marriage. Eleanor was just 12 or 13 when she married Henry III, um, who was 28. Eleanor and Isabella were in many ways typical of the choice of bride for England's kings, pretty much from the time of the Norman Conquest, um, when England was eager to return, retain its territories in France. For this reason, England's queens were predominantly, though not exclusively, chosen from the French aristocracy um, until the marriage of Edward IV to Elizabeth Woodville in 1464 broke with this tradition. The young women and girls who arrived in England to be queen usually did so through a negotiation to resolve conflict. Consequently, they, were often, they often entered a hostile environment from the outset. Given their young age and their cultural displacement, it is simply astonishing what England's medieval queens were able to achieve, and Isabella, of course, is no exception. So Isabella at least had one close friend and ally, um, which was Queen Margaret, her aunt. Margaret herself was only 17 when she married the 60-year-old Edward I. From the outset, however, Isabella was plunged deep into political turmoil. At the time of her marriage to Edward, in Boulogne in 1308, Edward I was dead. Controversially, Edward II, on leaving England's shores, appointed his notorious favourite, Piers Gaveston, as regent. Edward's infatuation with Gaveston was the first obstacle that the young queen had to overcome. The coronation of Edward and Isabella at Westminster Abbey on the 25th of February 1308 caused a sensation as Gaveston formed a conspicuous part of the ceremony, seeming to supplant the young queen uh, in the prominence that he was given. Arrayed in a gown of royal purple, stitched with innumerable pearls, he was also, um, according to some accounts, um, given by Edward Isabella's jewellery. So this is an, uh, one of the first indications of jewellery figuring in the life of the tragedy, really, that surrounded Isabella. So and what might her jewellery have looked like? Um, I've chosen this brooch uh, from the V&A as a, an indicative piece that corresponds to our aristocratic taste and fashion at the end of the 13th and the early years of the 14th century. It's studded with garnets and sapphires, set in a wreath of naturalistically rendered leaves. It's display, it displays one of the most enduring colour combinations in medieval jewellery design, combining hot reds and cool blues. The red suggestive of both romantic and religious passion, and the celestial blue of the sapphire, evocative of paradise and favoured by ecclesiastics for its power to cool the blood and subdue erotic desire. On the reverse of the brooch is this technically accomplished design in yellow, a detail hidden from view um, and probably only appreciated by the wearer. The use of niello was a strong characteristic also of Italian jewellery, and this is pertinent to our story in as much as Isabella, it seems, had a penchant for Italian art and notably Italian goldsmith's work. These two exquisite pieces of jewellery might also resemble Isabella's possessions. The signet ring, in this instance set with a medieval intaglio resembling a classical gem. Um, these were collected, the classical gems were collected and circulated through Italy and France to aristocratic markets in England and would have been used to seal private correspondence. Um, while the charming double ring brooch 
is of a scale and proportion to have been a suitable fastening for a young girl's garments. Now, uh, jewellery or adornment or um, metalwork also figures in, in Isabella's history potentially um, through the production of these um, lead plaques and, and badges. Um, so thus far, I've outlined as Isabella's credentials as queen and the initial challenges that she faced. These challenges escalated as Edward's relationship with Gaveston led to baronial unrest and the eventual execution of Gaveston by the forces of the rebel Thomas of Lancaster in 1312. The end of Gaveston, however, was not the end of the challenge that, fa that Isabella faced. For her, her husband's affections by the 1320s, um, Edward took his new favourite, um, Hugh Dispenser, which led to an escalation of political and emotional turmoil. Uh, and to summarise, this saw Isabella unite forces with the Earl of March, Roger Mortimer, to depose Edward. Edward was initially imprisoned in Berkeley Castle and then brutally murdered in 1327. So this is all really high drama when you think about the landscape of the Middle Ages. Um, it's at this point that Isabella assumes the mantle of traitor, known here on as the she-wolf of France, and effectively ruling the kingdom with Roger Mortimer. So this satirical badge has been interpreted as a representation of Isabella at this time. Um, inscribed with the word mother in English, it may represent a young Edward III in supplication to the tyrannical Isabella. Isabella used her period of power to amass huge wealth, allocating to herself 20,000 marks equivalent to £13,333 per year between the years 1327 and 1330. And this is a level of wealth that was exceeded only throughout the course of the entire 14th century by John of Gaunt in the 1390s. So she's the second richest person in the 14th century in England. Um, these mass-produced lead plaques and badges were a precursor to the dissemination of political dissent by prints. Um, and here's another example, which is a, a larger piece, which in fact is a devotional plaque to the sort of the popular um, cult of Thomas of Lancaster, who himself uh, met an early demise at Edward's hands um, as, the principal as Edward's principal opponent and the perpetrator of Gaveston's death. Um, so he was executed by... Um, Edward at Pontefract in 1322, and thereupon a cult of Thomas of Lancaster, Lancaster ensued. Um, but the next batch brings us back more closely potentially to Isabella. So in the same vein, this obscene batch showing a queen in a boat holding a crowned phallus aloft may represent Isabella returning to England from France having effectively cuckolded the king through her adulterous relationship with Roger Mortimer. By further allusion, it might also refer to the badges relating to the cult of the Virgin uh, at Boulogne, the place of Isabella and Edward's marriage. The rule of Isabella and Mortimer was brought to an abrupt end in 1330, when Edward III o overthrew them. Mortimer was executed for his part in the deposition and murder of Edward II, and Isabella was spared, apparently, only on account of her relationship with the son now, uh, with her son now the king. At this point, for a period at least, she appears to retire from public life, at least according to chronicle sources. So Foissart relates, um, the king soon after, by the advice of his council, ordered his mother to be confined in a goodly castle and gave her plenty of ladies to wait and attend on her, as well as knights and esquires of honour. He made her a handsome allowance to keep, the, to keep and maintain the state she had been used to, but forbade that she should ever go out or show herself abroad. The queen thus passed her time meekly, and the king, her son, visited her twice or thrice a year. So it sounds almost like she's under house arrest, but then when we look at other records, we um, understand that she's about to enter a new phase in her career. So it won't surprise you to, to learn that Foissart's chronicle doesn't represent the reality of the remainder of Isabella's life. Um, and at this point, we enter into a phase as um, diplomat, which in fact, I mean, since her marriage, she'd more or less been a diplomatic force between the French and the English. But she becomes much more active at this point. Two principal sources give us a fleeting glimpse of the profile and wealth that Isabella continued to enjoy. The British Library manuscript contains an account of the expenses of Isabella's household and document many of her movements from the final year of her life, dating from the beginning of October 1337, of 1357 to the 4th of December 
1358, uh, which was about three months after her death. A second inventory of her, go of her goods upon her death is contained in the National Archives. Um, what is notable about the expense account um, from, eight, from 1357 to 58 is the amount of money that Isabella spends on plate and jewellery. So she spends, uh, within that year, £1,399, which amounts in today's money to something in the region of £1,126,808. Um, and the most costly items were purchased from Italian merchants, from whom she secured pieces by the goldsmiths Pardo Padi and Bernardo Donati to the tune of £421, or a little over 339000 today. She pays £105 for a chaplet of gold set with ballast rubies, sapphires, emeralds, diamonds and pearls, and £80, um, roughly £64,500, for a crown of gold set with sapphires and rubies of, um, uh, rubies of Alexandria and pearls. So both items, both of these two items, uh, were probably purchased um, in order for her to celebrate um, the Feast of St. George at Windsor um, in April 1358. This was an occasion of great pomp attended by uh, many international dignitaries. So at this time, Isabella was clearly very actively engaged in engineering peace with France, repeatedly entertaining at her castles and other residences, including a house in Lombard Street, London, uh, a whole cast of characters as a consequence of the Battle of Poitiers. The French king, Jean Le Bon, was captive in England, along with the Marshal of France and other nobles, such as the Earl of uh, Tonkaville, all of whom were uh, frequent visitors to Isabel. Others include William, Archbishop of Saint, who arrives in England as part of the peace negotiations. So among the other items um, acquired in her final year, a pair of tablets of gold enameled with diverse histories um, was acquired for nine pounds, a mere 7,248. Now, of course, as we all know, the frustrating things about these in, in medieval inventories is that they don't give quite enough detail. So there's nothing in that um, description to say, in fact, that the diverse histories relate to um, religious stories or secular, and it may very well be that, that it was a secular scene that was depicted on these tablets. Uh, and it also doesn't describe the enamel as translucent enamel, but this is exactly the sort of product that, of course, was being produced um, for the luxury markets in Paris and influenced the output of English goldsmiths. Um, but this, um, this, one of my favourite, my absolutely entire favourite object, actually, from the British Museum, so um, is um, a, reliquary pen, a reliquary pendant um, that opens to reveal uh, these translucent leaves. It's... Um, dates from about 1340, um, so a little bit earlier than this period of um, Isabella's um, collecting, but it's, it's absolutely regal and um, outstanding in its quality. Um, an amethyst cover um, with uh, enamel, um, um, enamel, translucent enamel interior, um, and a, um, a uh, painted parchment covered with rock crystal that to all intents and purposes would have looked like enamel when it was first produced. Um, now, from the um, inventory of um, from the inventory of, of Isabella's sort of post mortem accounts, um, we get a little more of a flavour of what she'd been collecting during her longer life, rather than that final year. From this, we learn that Isabella, um, within her chamber, had a uh, had a, um, a coffer where wherein she kept some of the most precious things including 31 diamond rings. And this is quite unusual. So the quantity of the rings is quite unusual. So she really is like the prototype for diamonds are a girl's best friend. I mean, she's collecting diamonds before um, really the, the power of the, um, the way of enhancing them through cutting has really been developed. So the diamonds may have looked like this. And I chose this um, Italian ring really because it sort of also reflects her interest um, in Italian goldsmith's work. Um, now, the um, patronage of Italian goldsmiths was also matched by um, the patronage of um, Italian painters. And Paul Binsky has speculated that Isabella's role in spreading Italian artistic influences in England um, was um, quite um, significant. 
She also collects cameos um, and um, and uh, one of the famous rings that she um, that she obtains is the ring of Saint Dunstan, which is both a precious jewel but also a relic. Um, and I put this famous page up from Matthew Paris's um, illustration of, of jewels because it, it um, illustrates um, the jewel of Saint Al uh, the jewel of Saint Alban, which is both a jewel and a religious relic. Um, the, the ring of St. Dunstan that Isabella acquired um, is a ring that had passed from Edward I to Gaveston when he was still in favour with Edward I and before um, he fell out of favour and was exiled. So somehow Isabella must have appropriated this at the time of Gaveston's demise, um, perhaps even as a trophy um, over her vanquished enemy. So and that's my final slide. Thank you. Thank you, James. You give us a sense of the political weight of such awards with the necessary effort to match to what we have and what is described. And I think we always have to do that. And but that's the only way also to give us the sense of the political need also for mm -hmm. such uh, jewels. And we come with that, I think, also with the uh, point we had already, how you use the commercial market, especially if you're Isabella of France and come from a commercial place. And when you're in London, where do you get your things to transform them from commodity to objects of royal power, let's say. Mm -hmm. and so, And um, I think that's a very, um, a very great uh, insight into this uh, sort of questions which are always there, yeah. uh, I think, when we look at, this, at these objects. Any questions, remarks? Thank you, James. That was so interesting. And I'm just wondering if you saw anything in terms of Isabel's, Isabel's shopping that maps on to her kind of instigation of the Hundred Years' War. And of course, it's through um, her patron, or it's through her line that the English kings are able to mm -hmm. um, argue that they should um, get the crown of France after the end of the Capetian line. And I'm just wondering if her um, provisioning patterns change with that political shift? Does she move away from France or does it increase? Does she move towards Italian merchants? Yeah. It's not really detailed enough to kind of to plot it in quite that way, you know, and of course they're quite, the, the accounts are, um, one of them represents a sort of longer collecting but not in a systematic way and it's just a, an inventory of things that are gathered together at her death and the, the, the final year of her life is probably the one that gives us most information because it tells us where she is, who she's entertaining, and what she's buying. And, of course, it's not just jewellery. It's also plate, and she's buying gifts for, for people. She's also furnishing her various houses. You know, she has uh, 50 castles in England. I mean, there's, there's a reason why she's powerful, and she inherits from Margaret I all of her um, dowry lands and, in turn, uh, the lands that Margaret inherited from Eleanor of Provence. So there's a, there's a whole sort of narrative here about female wealth and agency, you know, which is kind of really interesting. But it doesn't give us that sort of detail. Um, she's certainly um, not leaving, as far as I'm aware, in, in the, that later period. She's not leaving England, uh, but she's making pilgrimage in England. But I, I don't see her returning to France, I think, uh, unless I miss something. 